with us all over the congregation. The words will be on the screen. If you need a book, 110, Heaven's Jubilee. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. glad to be in God's house this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He is worthy of our thanksgiving. And let's just ask him to meet among us today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we would not approach you in any other merit, any other name than Jesus and the finished work of Christ. Bless the service today. Make it what it needs to be to meet every need that's here. And you'll be crowned with all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Because we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Come on.
His mercy washed all my sins away. And what He did for me that day was a price I know He paid by His grace.
Let's all stand together while the choir comes down. Let's fellowship a while. Thank you so much for being here this morning in the house of God. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them you love them. Amen. you may be seated. This is the first Sunday of our Sunday school campaign. We'll say more back in a moment, but our thought for today is building on the right foundation, and our children here have a special song for us they're going to sing in just a moment. Do want to go to the Lord in prayer. They're taking Brother Doug Scott to the hospital, hurting in his chest, his jaw, and uh, been hurting all week, and they finally got him to go. I think they called 911 finally, and so he's on his way to Fayette Piedmont. Pray about that, please. Uh, Barry Cron is on his way home. You know, he had that emergency surgery. Went back to the hospital late Friday, but everything's okay. They just got to take their time. So let's remember these two men right there today, especially in prayer, that right now they'll experience, right now that Brother Doug will experience the peace of God, the healing of God, the help of God in his life. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you on behalf of our dear brother in the back of that ambulance right now. Lord, you are above him, you're beneath him, you're beside him, you're before him, you're with him, and I pray that your presence and peace and Holy Ghost power will be felt, be known. I pray virtue and healing come to him and bless Catherine as well and comfort her. God, we're asking you to do exceeding, abundant, above all that we ask or think, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory because we ask it in Jesus' name, and all of the agree with me in Jesus' name, say amen. Well, ain't there some pretty boys and girls up here? How many pretty boys and girls are up here? How many mean boys and girls up here? All right. Brother Joe, take it on right there.
such a wonderful thing. I know these grand, these children, everybody. I've never seen so many phones uh, up in the church house uh, until just now. But so thankful for that. You give them one more hand as they're reading this message for them. make a few of make a few announcements while they're going ahead being dismissed I want to thank you so much if this is the first time you've been visiting with us thank you so much for making harvest baptist tabernacle a place of your worship today we're so thankful for that hopefully you did receive one of those visitors packets if you did the inside of there is one of those visitor cards and we would love it if you would take time just a few moments right now fill that out and then after service take it to our welcome center we'll be happy to give you a gift of our appreciation for you coming and being a part of our service today and it is such a blessing to have you here this was the first part of our blueprints program if you missed Sunday school you missed a blessing so I want you to come and be a part of that please come and be a part of the blueprints program that we have going on right now building our faithful families for the future and uh, the, each of those teachers are taking time to be able to spend time with that about that then also if you notice out front once again we're not building on to anything that is a prop for you to go ahead have your picture taken in front of and just enjoy a good time uh, I would even recommend get inside there stick your head out a window go out the door something like that make it fun just have fun with your family on that and then that way you just have a really good good time also they do have these uh, wristbands that you can make sure that you grab one of those right over there when you get done with that then at the end of service I believe it's uh, that time we'll be giving out a devotion to each and every one of our families take some time and we think that if you build your family upon the rock the foundation then you spend time in the word of God every night with your family and take some time to do that and we have put together a devotional for this week from each and every one of the staff members has taken time to be able to do that and uh, I know you'll be a blessing for that. Uh, college kids, their uh, care packages are also up there available out at the Welcome Center so if you want to take care of one of those we're so thankful for the college people that are uh, young you know, people that are here dedicating their lives and hard work here in the church and we're so thankful for that as well. Then choir practice Brother Tom, we're going to be doing that at 4.30 this afternoon, so make sure that you come out choir, and once again, give the choir a hand, they did such an awesome job, Brother Tom as well, thank you so much for that. You go ahead men, we'll go ahead and receive our tithes and offerings for this morning, we are so thankful for your faithfulness in your tithes and offerings, it is a blessing to be able to see God's people continuing on, as they are blessed by God, continuing to help and to assist the church by their tithes and offerings as well. We're going to ask Brother Chris, if he would, missionary, thank you so much, for, brother, if you'll come up here and uh, have a, a prayer for us over the offering, we would so much thank you for that, and uh, you just go ahead and we'll have a wonderful service. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here, Brother Chris. God bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your holy name this morning, God. We thank you so much for what you have done in our lives. God, I thank you, Lord, for where you brought me from, God. Lord, there's people in here that can testify and raise their hand, Lord, if they came out of the miry pits of hell. Lord, I've been set upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the work that you're doing here at Harvest. Thank you for the pastor and all the staff. And, Lord, we just ask your blessings upon this service. Bless this offering this morning. God, continue to use it as you see fit throughout this community and this world. In your son Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Thank you so much. Such a blessing. Appreciate it. Before we get into preaching time, you go ahead, you pray for Brother Matt and Brother Tom and Miss Beth. They're going to be singing up for us this morning. How many of you know that you're saved without a shadow of a doubt? You're saved or born again. Aren't you glad God's still saving old sinners? Amen. I'm thankful for that. We're going to get to baptize some folks today, so it's just going to be a wonderful day. You pray for them as they sing. The drunk on the street, the rich in their palaces, the poor and unlearned, and men of degree. They all have a soul in need of salvation, and they all have to come by Calvary. Well, I am so glad God saves old sinners. I'm thrilled. But the biggest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that he would say, an old sinner like me, was I so bad that I needed forgiveness, or was I so since prison and I was as lost as a sinner could be well I am so glad God saves old sinners I'm thrilled and amazed how he sets them free but the biggest Surprise in redeeming old sinners is that he would say, An old sinner like me. But the biggest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that he would say, Before the greatest pastor in America comes to preach to us. Amen. Amen. He told me to introduce our friends, Brother Chris McClellan, his wife. They are from Louisiana. He's a music minister. And we met this summer, and he spent the weekend with us a little bit, and uh, spent the weekend with us. We sent him to a Braves game. And he liked it so much, he went back last night. And we're going to keep him in town because we're on a winning streak. Amen. So glad to have Brother Chris, my friend, with us all the way from Louisiana. Thank you all for being with us. And then <clears throat> Brother Joe told me to introduce my family, so my mother is with us today. And then this is Miss Rebecca. She's from Mexico working in our school this year. And then my aunt and uncle, my dad's sister and brother-in-law, Sharon and Blaine, are with us. And they came down for my sister's wedding yesterday. And then, of course, we have a young man that came all the way home from Pensacola to see his mom and dad finally, amen. And uh, so glad to have Spencer home, Kayla. So that is my family visiting Who's today. that girl with uh, With Spencer? That's his, uh, oh, and best mom. Oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Greatest mother-in-law in all the world. Uh, amen. Best mama is here today, all the family. And thank y'all for being with us.
Welcome to Harvest Baptist Tabernacle. We're glad to have you today. The world's greatest song leader. <laughs> no, the world's greatest announcement maker. Amen. Oh, I'm glad that amidst the storms and the troubles and all the factions of life, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And uh, are you folks from Ohio or Tennessee? Ohio, and we're glad to have you. They have folks from Tennessee too, and you can't tell anybody from anything but from Tennessee. You can just tell they're from Tennessee, amen. The Lord is good. John chapter number one. The Lord willing, this Sunday, next Sunday, we'll go to another book in the Bible. But we've been preaching all these miracles of Christ. And remember, when Jesus performed that first miracle, when he turned the water to wine, he said, this is just the beginning. And we've been preaching on you ain't seen nothing yet. Because every one of these miracles, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And God just does some awesome things. And they teach us that there is no boundaries and borders and limits to the authority and the power and the sovereignty and the lordship of Jesus Christ. And there are seven what we call nature miracles in John. But remember, as we begin to preach that, we could not overlook the miracle of the new birth in chapter 3. We could not look over the uh, John chapter 8, the miracle when God set somebody free from their addictions and their chains of sin. And the last time we dealt with this, we could not overlook the greatest miracle of Christ coming back from the grave the great miracle of the resurrection of Christ. Well, there are two more themes that are covered in the Gospel of John that I don't believe you can rightly leave out when it comes to miracles. And of course, we'll deal with that next week, the Lord willing, the miracle of the second coming of Jesus Christ. He is coming again. You've not seen the last of him. He that will come will come and will not tarry. But this morning, I want us to go to the very first chapter because what I'm going to preach about this morning is literally the cornerstone of all the other miracles. I'm glad he walked on the water. I'm glad he turned the water to wine. I'm glad he calmed the storm. I'm glad he opened the eyes of the blind. I'm glad that he died on the cross. I'm really glad that he arose again. But none of that, none of that could have been possible if Jesus Christ had not came into this world, if he have not have left the ivory palaces of glory to come into this world to be our Savior, there would be no work of the cross. There would be no miracles. There would be no resurrection. And listen to this statement this morning. If the resurrection of Christ is the foundation of our faith, and it is, then the incarnation of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. If God had not arobed himself in human flesh through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and came into this world to be our Savior, the death, the life, the miracles, the resurrection, I'm glad God sent a Savior to live the Christian life. I'm glad he sent a Savior to die at the cross. I'm glad he sent a Savior to rise again from the dead. And again, if the bodily resurrection of Christ is the foundation of our faith, then what we're preaching on this morning is the cornerstone of that foundation, that God sent his best. I take that back. God sent his all when Jesus Christ came into this world. And let's read about it this morning in John chapter number 1. And begin reading in verse number one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him not anything was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. For the sake of time, come down to verse number 11. He came. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. I'm glad for verse 12, but as many. Do you fit in that category this morning? 
I'm glad I'm not in verse 11, those who said no. I'm glad I'm in verse 12, those who said yes. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Look in verse 14, and the word was made flesh. Now, buddy, we're getting on holy ground here. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And to put the icing on the cake, look in verse number 29, the next day. John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And again, if the bodily resurrection of Christ and the work of the cross is the very foundation of our faith, then the incarnation of Christ, God coming to us through Jesus, is the cornerstone of our faith. You know what the incarnation of Christ is? God coming to us? Listen to this. It is the miracle. It is the mystery. It is the majesty of our faith. You know what separates our faith from all the other religions in the world? Here it is. Our God came to us. I have underlined holler hallelujah right there. That's what separates our faith from all the other faiths in the world. Our God came to us. We didn't bow down before a totem pole. We didn't walk in a smoke-filled shrine and kneel down to a statue that has no eyes to see and ears to hear and mouth to speak and heart to love and hands to help. No, our God took the initiative. Our sovereign God took the initiative and came to you and I when we could not go to where he is. If you don't think God loves lost humanity, ladies and gentlemen, God came to us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad God didn't keep peace and salvation and deliverance and fellowship and relationship and joy to himself. God came to us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that he came. You understand, I'm glad that he lived. I'm glad that he prayed. I'm glad that he performed miracles. I'm glad that he taught great lessons. I'm glad that he died. I'm glad that he shed his blood. I'm really glad that he got up one Easter Sunday morning. But do you realize none of that would have been possible had God not and came to you and I through the person of Jesus Christ Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to report to you that old-time salvation is not pulling man up by his bootstraps, cleaning him off outside, hoping one day he's good enough to go to heaven. No, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that the sovereign, holy God of heaven came to you and I that could not lift ourselves up, that could not clean ourselves up, but through the finished work of the cross, through the shedding of his blood, cleaned us up, made us a fit subject for heaven. And brother, I'm not going to heaven someday because I climbed some ladder and got to God. I'm going to heaven one day because God condescended down from some ladder and came to this world to be our Lord and to be our Savior. You say, well, brother Joe, why would you include that in the miracle? What are you waiting for? You know what a miracle is? It's something that happens that can only be explained. God did it. Name me another modern religion in this world where the founder in chief paid his own debt, died his own death, gave up the ghost by the volition of his own will. You want to hear a miracle? Here it is. 
that the sovereign God, the almighty God, the perfect holy God of heaven could, would, and did condescend, came to us through the person of Jesus Christ. Notice those three things. He could, but he would, and he did. That's what separates Jesus Christ from all the other founders of religion in the world. They couldn't. If they could have, they wouldn't have. And if they would have, evidently they didn't because they would have, they could have, but they didn't. That makes me think of George Johnson, the old cathedrals. Can he could he witty? Yes, can he could he witty? He did. You have to have the gift to sing that song, brother. But I'm telling you, aren't you glad he could now I'm a feeling something coming up in here now. Aren't you glad he could pay the price? Aren't you glad he would pay the price? Aren't you glad he did pay the price? Aren't you glad that the sovereign God of heaven could come to you and I? Aren't you glad he would come to you and I? But I wonder if there's anybody in this tabernacle this morning. You're more than glad that he could. You're more than glad that he would. You are glad that he did. And one day I will occupy the city of God in a glorified body because he came to me. There's about four or five questions I want to ask and settle them out of this text this morning concerning the incarnation, the miracle of God coming to us. First of all, I want to look at where. Where did he come from? Secondly, the way. How did he come? Number three, to whom did he come to? Number four, the why. Why did he come? And lastly, the what. What are you going to do about it? in the light of the fact that God came to us through the person of Jesus Christ. Question number one, where did he come from? I remind her that that little girl in class, her teacher didn't believe in God. Her teacher was an evolutionist. Her teacher was an agnostic. And she said, okay, all of you little boys and girls whose mom and daddy's taught you, there is a God and he's real. I want to ask you something. Where did he come from? Little girl raised her hand. She said, ma'am, he didn't come from nowhere. She said, everybody's got to come from somewhere. She said, oh, no, ma'am, he came from nowhere because he was before there was anywhere to come from. Have you ever noticed when you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story of Jesus, the Gospels, Matthew traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Abraham. Then when you come to the Gospel of Luke, Luke traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to the first man named Adam. But brother, when you come to John's Gospel, he said, let me tell you where he come from. Let me tell you how far back we're going. Hallelujah. We're not going back to Abraham. We're not even going back to Adam. How far are you going back? Verse one, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And if you have the right Bible, that word, word is capitalized. It's not just a word spoken, but Christ, the incarnate, the living Word of God. And you say, well, how do you know that's his name? Well, compare the book of the Revelation, chapter 19. When the door opens and the Son of God comes out of glory riding that white stallion and his vestures dipped in blood and the Bible said written on his thigh was his name, same letter, same capital, the Word of God. This Word in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. That is speaking of no other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to me this morning, Bethlehem was not his beginning. Can I say that again? Bethlehem was not his beginning. That was his earthly manifestation. You said, where is his beginning? He had no beginning because he is God manifested to you and I. I see in this text the pre-existence of Christ. 
And if you don't believe he was alive and well before Bethlehem, who was it 2,000 years before that that appeared to Abraham on the plains of Mamre? They walked through the sacrifice of Abraham's altar. Who was it that appeared to Joshua on the city limits of the walls of Jericho? Who was it that came to Daniel and put a padlock on the, on the, on the jaws of the lion? Who was it that the three Hebrew boys spotted walking in the midst of the flames? Hallelujah. He said, I see four, and the form of the fourth is likened unto a son of God. And I just want to say, if an old rotten, filthy, dirty sinner like the king of Babylon knows who Jesus is, how much more do the redeemed, blood-washed saints of God in this room today know who our Savior is, the Lord Jesus Christ? I see the preexistence of Christ, but I see the glory and the majesty of his creating power. For it said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the same was with God and all things were made by him. Jesus Christ even predates creation. You say, do you have any scripture for that? How much do you want? Let's just use one. And God said before he ever started the six day creating program, he said, let us, let us. If God would have been all by himself, he'd have said, let I. But he said, let us. Referring to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Don't let that confuse you. You said, I don't understand how that can be one God manifested in three persons. Don't let that confuse you. There's a lady sitting in the back back here that calls me husband. Now, she calls me other things, but we're at church right now calls me husband. There's a little mother in North Carolina calls me every Sunday morning at 9.30 and prays the Holy Ghost on me. Calls me son. There are three wicked, diabolical, ungodly ladies in this world that call me brother. They don't have the microphone right now. I do. My phone will be lit up by the time this service is over. They go to their church and watch us while their preacher's preaching and one of them's married to the pastor. There are two children on this property, two young adults on this property that call me dad or father. I have five. I don't know if I've ever told you about them or not, but I have five of the most beautiful, educated, talented granddaughters that's ever been, and they call me all kind of things. But there's just one me. You call me pastor. You call me brother. You call me preacher. A few people have respect and call me Dr. Arthur. And you know what that doctor's degree on my name means? It's like the curl on a pig's tail. It just makes it look cute. It don't put any meat on the ham. Can I get a witness? But I'm here to tell you I'm a finite, I'm an unworthy human being. And if I don't have a problem being a husband to one and a son to one and a daddy to two and a grandpa to five and a preacher to a whole lot of people and just be one little simple old me, I promise you God who is absolute holy and omnipotent and sovereign and almighty has no problem being father, son, and spirit and say there's one faith and there's one Lord and there's one baptism. Can I remind you today if your faith is anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ, it it is on a solid foundation, a true foundation. There is no other foundation. Where did he come from? He came from the beginning out of the rims of glory. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Can I tell you today that's why he offers eternal life? Because you can't offer something you don't have. Hallelujah. And because he is the eternal God, he offers you and us eternal life, the where. Secondly, I want to cover this question, the way. If he was in the beginning and he was the living word of God and all things were made by him, how? What is the way that he came to you and I? I love verse 14. And the word, the logos, the living word, the same one in verse 14 is the same one in verse 1, 2, 3, 4. And the word, and the word that was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among 
us. Boy, you're talking about a verse. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only, listen, begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me say this to you very kindly, very humbly, if I can. If the version of the Bible that you're holding in your hand this morning leaves out that one word, only begotten, you got the wrong kind. I think I'll hammer that one more time. If the version of the Bible you have in your hand this morning leaves out that word begotten, only begotten, you have the wrong kind. Can I remind you this morning that Jesus Christ was not a son of God. He was not one of the sons of God. He was the only begotten son of God. That word, that phrase only begotten literally means only one of its kind. Only one of of its kind. Honey, there is no other that was coexisting with the Father before the foundation of the world. There was no other that took upon him the form of human flesh. There is no other that left the ever palaces of glory and came through a virgin womb to be born in a manger, to live a perfect life and die a perfect death and shed perfect blood and arise again for our justification. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There are not two. There are not four. There are not sevens. There's one and Jesus is God. God's only begotten son. If you've trusted Christ this morning, you are a son of God. If you've believed the gospel today, you're one of God's children, but I'm not Jesus, and you're not Jesus. There was only one like him, and aren't you glad the only one like him came into your heart when you trusted him by faith? How did God come to us? Through the virgin birth, through the, through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God came to us through Jesus when he was born of that virgin. That's why the angels could say, call his name, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Part of that word means God, but the first part of that word means he's here. You realize all through that Old Testament, from the very first altar that Abel built, brought the excellent sacrifice. They're looking up. God put a window in the ark that Noah could look up. The prophets of the Old Testament would look up. Oh, but we that live on this side of Calvary, we look in. Yeah, I still look up to God, but I'm gonna tell you something. He is not a distant God. He is a very present God. You say, preacher, you act like you really believe that. I'm not acting. I really do believe that. Let me tell you who my Lord and Savior is this morning. The same one that separated the waters of the Red Sea and the same one that thundered from the burning bush and the same one that walked the charred walls of Jericho and the same one that walked into the fiery furnace and the same one that walked in the lion's den with Brother Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, God came to us through the virgin birth. His son, Jesus Christ, came into this world of sin and sorrow. God came to us. How did he do it? And the word was made flesh and dwelt, tabernacled, manifested itself among us and we beheld his glory. Several months ago, we went through the tabernacle. That means God's dwelling place. And in the old manifested the Shekinah glory on top of the tabernacle, that building, when the blood was applied. And the people could see the glory of God hovering over that tabernacle. God dwelt with them. But oh, when you come to the virgin birth to this very moment, God doesn't need a building to manifest his glory. God's son, Jesus Christ, tabernacled among us 
and the, and the same Shekinah awesome raw pure virgin glory of God that dwelt on that tabernacle dwelt and manifested itself on the person of Christ our Lord and Savior that's why he could say peace be still that's why he could say to the devil come out of him that's why I could say Lazarus come forth can I tell you our hope and our faith is not built on the sinking sands of dead man made religion but it's on Christ the solid rock that God came to us through the person of Jesus Christ the where in the beginning the way the word was made flesh think about this today the who who did he come to or who did he come for well verse 11 said he came unto his own speaking of the Jews and what did they do and his own received him not that should not have been a prize to those disciples Mark if they'd have read Isaiah 53 when God said this Savior that's coming this Messiah that's coming he will be despised and rejected of men the religionists rejected him. The government rejected him. Even some of the common people rejected him. But can I report to you today, everybody did not reject him. Everybody did not refuse him. Some said, Lord, I believe, and they were transformed by the amazing grace of God. And I know everybody in this world has not believed on Christ. I know everybody in this world has not received Christ. Some have rejected him. But I believe I'm preaching to a church full of people this morning. You have not rejected him. You have not turned him away. You have said yes to him. You have received him. You say, who did he come for? Now, let me just preface this. If you are a Calvinist persuasion. You may be dialing 911 in a minute in a phone book but I'm going to tell you who he came for. He came for all of those that would receive him. The only difference I see in verse 11 and verse 12, those who said yes and those who said no. Someone said, how do you know Jesus came for me? Did you say yes? But if you'd have said no, he'd have still came. He came for those who loved him and those who didn't love him. He came for those who didn't care and he came for those that did care. I want to tell you how loving the sovereign God of heaven is. Boy, I love preaching the Bible. I love preaching the gospel. I want to tell you how wonderful and awesome the sovereign God of heaven is and his infinite wisdom, knowing before the foundation of the world that men would despise him and reject him and refuse him and nail him to a cross. He loved us anyway, and he came to us anyway, and he died for us anyway. And I'm glad when I heard the gospel, I didn't throw up a wall of rebellion and say no. I'm gonna open up my heart and I said yes. You say, it looks like Jesus came for everybody can I say today you're in one or two categories you either said yes to Jesus or you said no to Jesus but it looks like to me in verse number 11 he came into his own and his own received him not but he came verse 12 but as many received him the power become the sons of God they received him but he came if you put verse 11 right there next to verse number 12, it just looks like if there's only two categories, those who said yes and those who said no, and he came for those who said no and he came for those who said yes, I'm just deducing the fact he must have come for everybody. Let me wait on out here in some more deep water. Therefore, if he came for everybody and he came for those that said no, but he came anyhow, and he came for those who said yes, but he came anyhow, it looks like to me he came for everybody and it's up to them whether they receive him or reject him or go to hell or go to heaven or not. Lord, have mercy. Knowing that he would go to the cross, knowing that he would be despised and rejected, knowing that he would be the man acquainted with grief and sorrow, yet he came. You say, ladies and gentlemen, who did Jesus Christ come for? Let me bring it home in Jonesboro, 15, 1974. We ain't been at 1599, Betty Tamajou, in 45 years, but I'm hung up. Who? Let's bring it home. 1974, Walt Stevens Road, Jonesburg, Georgia, Clayton County, Georgia, United States of America, the Northern Hemisphere. Who did he come for? You. 
and you and you and you and if you want to know him hallelujah you can but what I love about it China Russia Afghanistan Brazil Chile Mexico boy they're coming from everywhere we got a whole church full of them over there they come from all over the world to get to us from Jamaica from Barbados from India man we have people all over the world this very moment trusting and receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. Why? Yeah, he came from the portals of glory and he came to the womb of a virgin. But aren't you glad he came for everyone that would receive him as their Savior? You know what I get accused of? Oh, Brother Joe's a good fellow, but he offers the gospel to everybody. Pastor Arthur preaches the gospel. He thinks the whole world can be saved. I got some scripture for that. Can I quote a little scripture? Don't you just love what God says? I like telling you what God says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who sure believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You say, I'm an Old Testament guy. I, okay, we'll go over there. We'll go over there. Hope, everyone that is a thirsty come. He with that money, he with that price. Isaiah 55, come and draw water out of the wells of salvation. Here's an Old Testament verse. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. But I, 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 all right, but I'm a New Testament guy. Great, let's quote from the last book and the last chapter, almost the last verse of the New Testament. And the bride says, come, and the spirit says, come and whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely aren't you glad ladies and gentlemen he is the universal savior he is the worldwide savior and he is the only savior that matters the where the who the way for quickly the why why would God go through all of this condescending in the form of Jesus Christ and dwelling and living among us. Well, verse 17 said, the law was given by Moses. That'll put you in hell, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Why do you think he said grace and truth? He's just talking about the law, grace and truth. I'll tell you why. That law is truth. That law said if you die in your sins where God is, you can't go. That law said the wages of sin is death. That law said your sins have separated you from God. Yeah, and if the law is all we had, we would still be of all men most miserable. But wait a minute, here's grace. You couldn't keep the law. And the law wasn't good enough to set you free. So here comes grace. God living a perfect life through his son Jesus Christ doing what you could not do, saying what you could not say. And because, ladies and gentlemen, the law came by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Yes, he was perfect. He was sinless. He is the almighty God. But I'm glad he dwelt among men, he lived among men, and he died among men. And here's the miracle of the gospel. This holy, wonderful Savior receiveth sinners. John 1, 29, put the nail in the coffin. Why did he come? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Quickly this morning, go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God used innocence to try to fellowship with his creatures, but it wasn't enough. They failed. Go out through the rest of the book of Genesis and God used a man's conscience to try to fellowship with his creation. But yet, it wasn't enough because his conscience was wicked from its conception. God even tried promise. I'll make you some promises. I will if you will. They never would, so they voided the promise. God even said, okay, let's try some faith. You just believe me. I'm God and I could do it, but they were so depraved. 
They couldn't find faith to believe. And finally, God said from Mount Sinai, I'll give you the law. I'll give you a list of do's and don'ts. And all you got to do and I don't, you don't, I won't. And they failed every time. Their conscience failed them. Their innocence failed them. They couldn't muster up enough faith. They couldn't believe God's promises and they couldn't believe God's law. And man kept getting further and further and further from the throne closer and closer to the abyss. So God in his infinite sovereign mercy and omnipotent grace said, I'll tell you what we're gonna do, what the law couldn't do, what promise couldn't do, what faith couldn't do, what their conscience couldn't do, what their innocence couldn't do. I'll do it. Will you serve grace. They're unfit, they're undeserving, and they're unworthy. But I will step aside the ivory palaces of glory. I'll walk down the golden stairway, and I will manifest myself to them, and I will dwell among them, and I will eat with them and live with them, and one day I will die for them. But I will arise again in power, and I'll put my infinite precious blood on the altar. And therefore this morning we're saved, not because we got a good conscience, not because we mustered up enough faith to believe a set of rules but we're saved because we put our faith and our hope and our trust in the only foundation and that is Jesus Christ. In closing, listen to this, listen to this. It is not enough to believe in God to go to heaven. It is not enough to acknowledge there is a God and go to heaven. It is not enough to acknowledge that there was a Jesus and he lived. It is not enough to acknowledge that Jesus Christ was a good prophet and a good man and a good teacher. All of that is good, all of that is noble, but that is not enough. You say, well, what is? You must accept and acknowledge and put all of your faith in the fact that he's God and he died for you and he and he alone is the only Savior. You say, that's pretty narrow. I believe Jesus made it clear that there are two roads a man can travel. He can take that broad road of public opinion, but it leads to destruction. But there is a narrow way that leads to life, and you must choose the narrow way. What is that? Christ, God's Son, coming to you and I, living, dying, getting up from the grave. That is the only message that will set a man free and save him from his sin. That is the only message. Let me ask the last question, what? What is man going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Well, according to the text, there is no neutral. According to the text, there is no neutral. You know, if I went to a church and my pastor was bold enough to preach the gospel like it is, to men as they are, I believe I'd help him just a little bit. We're not telling people to join our church and then go to heaven. We're not telling them to keep a list of rules and regulations and then go to heaven. There's only one way they can go. They must, we must accept Jesus Christ as God's son. There is no other way. Evidently, there's no neutral ground. There's only one or two things a person can do. Receive him and live. Reject him and not live. He can't make that choice. He's already made his choice. He came. That last choice is yours and yours alone to make. But you say, I heard that other preacher say, if I keep the law, he didn't tell you right. But, but I heard that other preacher say that if I pay my bills and live a good life, if my bad outweighs my good, that, you know, God will let me in. He didn't tell you right. There's only two things a person can do with the gospel. That's receive it 
and believe it and live or refuse it and reject it and miss heaven. Them little boys and girls you saw standing up here, you know what kind of gospel they gonna hear back there this morning? Exactly what you heard right in here. On Wednesday night, your teens that'll be in that teen department, you know what kind of gospel they're gonna hear? The same one you're hearing this morning. Those who come on the Wednesday morning service and Brother Shane does this devotion with our folks, you know what kind of gospel they're gonna hear? Same one you're hearing this morning. And when Brother Shane stands here on Wednesday night and preaches his heart out, you know the same gospel you'll hear, the same one that you will hear this morning. I'll be here two more weeks, 38 years. And for 38 years, you know what gospel I preached? The same one that I'm preaching this morning. And if God gives me strength to stay another 250 years, by God's grace, I'll still be preaching this same gospel, this same Savior, because there is no other. You miss Jesus. You miss God. You miss God. You miss heaven. You miss heaven. You miss it all. You say it's so simple. Yes, it is so simple. That's why most people will stumble over it and stumble into a devil's hell. There's no neutral ground. It's receive Christ, be saved. Or it's say no to Christ and be lost. God cannot make that choice. God cannot make that decision. He's already made his decision. He came. Now the chest peace is in your corner. And I'd be real careful this morning which way I shoved it. You want to go to heaven when you die? Christ and Christ alone. I'm not supposed to sing. I want to sing so bad I can't stand it. I can't rap because I don't have enough rhythm so I'll jury read it. He was before rap was popular. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not a Savior like Jesus. There's not a friend like Jesus. There's no Redeemer like Jesus. Christ and Christ alone. The miracle that God would come to us through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. No wonder Philip Bliss said, Hallelujah, what a Savior. We're standing this morning with our heads bowed. Let me ask you this. If you died today, died in the next three seconds, do you know that you know where you're going? Do you know that you know? Do you know that you know that Christ is your Savior? Has there been a time and a place in your life when you said yes to Jesus Christ? Thank God for that, for that moment. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, He loves you. He came for you. He bled for you. And he died for you. And if you'll receive Christ, he'll do what he said he would do. What those who've done through the ages put their faith and trust in Christ. Brother Tom will sing a verse or two of an invitation number. If you need to be saved and trust Christ, like some of the others have recently that will be baptized today, trust the gospel. He is enough to save you today. My hope is built.